that I always find really outstanding is when you're going through the Trafford Center, when you're going to the Arndale or you're in the local convenience shop and there are songs about Jesus being played. It makes me want to just shout and say, hey, everybody, have a listen to this. You know, um, but we kind of are so used to, I, I guess, the Christmas carols. We're so used to songs like Joy to the World, Silent Night. What's a crazy song, Silent Night? Of course he cried, you know, as a baby. But, you know, all these carols being sung, it's almost like in, in the madness, the mayhem of Christmas, the whole point, the whole purpose of, of Jesus, the whole point of Christmas has been lost in society today. And, uh, you know, I don't know if it was uh, the, you know, um, uh, X Factor or Britain's Got Talent, but a few years ago, there was a gentleman who came on who sung about three things. He sung about three things, three things that were really important, three things that wherever I go and whatever I am doing, I'm always trying to be as aware as possible of where these three things are. The first one is my house keys and my car keys. My house keys and my car keys. What was amazing after the first service this morning was the amount of people who came to me at the door down there and said, Pastor Glenn, has anybody handed in some keys? I think three different people came and said they've left their keys at church. Can I just say this for a moment? Ladies, gents, this is church, but we don't know everybody in church. So don't just think that if you leave your phone on the chair, you can walk away for two hours and come back and expect for it to be there. Don't do that. But I'm always looking for the keys. You know, it's that thing that you're looking for to get out the house, uh, always trying to look to find the car keys, always looking to, to make sure you know where they are. Uh, this week, Sophie and I went away for two days to York to celebrate 22 years of marriage. And, uh, you know, I'm always, whenever we're walking through a market, you know, the shambles era of York, always just checking the pockets to make sure these three things are still there. The keys are really important. Now, give me a wave if you've ever woken up in the morning, raced around the house, can't find your keys because you left them on the outside of the front door in the lock. Give me a wave if you've ever done that before. Sophie, you as well. Yeah, yeah, lots, lots of people have done it. Keys, uh, always looking for keys. Uh, the other thing that, that we're always kind of checking to make sure that we haven't lost is our wallet. Am I right? The wallet or the purse. The purse, just making sure it's there. Uh, check this one out. Look at that. Now, come on. I'm going for a bigger response than that. I'm going to go both sides. Look at this. I've got bank cards in there. I've got my Costco card. Come on, somebody. Preach. I've I got season tickets for football in there. I've got a driver's license in there, which is clean. Thank you very much. Always, always kind of looking to see where that is. And probably the most important item of this holy trinity is this one. It's the mobile phone. Always checking to make sure it's there, especially when Ben Cooley is around. My phone is full of his selfies, uh, uh, you know, crazy things. Always looking for these, these things. So, so important. You know, always checking the pockets, making sure the keys, the wallet, and the phone are where they're meant to be. Uh, losing things. Uh, it, there's a sense where always in the midst of the mayhem of Christmas, making sure I've not lost these things. When I'm shopping, making sure I've not lost these things. And ultimately, when it comes to Christmas, us making sure that we haven't lost Jesus. Now, here's the thing. Society has lost Jesus. I love what Pastor Paul was talking about last week in the panto on the Sunday night. He was talking about the Christmas Jesus and the Easter Jesus being the same Jesus. That actually, it's so true that, that we've actually forgotten, society has forgotten what Christmas is truly all about. It's about God loving us so much that He comes from heaven to earth to win the way, the opportunity for us to connect our lives with God in eternity. That's really what the whole thing is about. But you know, losing Jesus is, is not a new thing. In fact, society has been losing Jesus for thousands of years. In fact, if we jump into the Bible, we have got a wonderful story, which as a parent makes me feel better about my parenting skills, where Mary and Joseph lose Jesus. Check this out. Luke chapter 2, 41 to 49. Every year, every year, because they were in the rhythm of spirituality every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. Every year, Jesus' parents went to the festival of the Passover. Now, the festival of the Passover was really God's party. 
It was a once a year event where all the people would go to Jerusalem to remember that God had got his people out of slavery in Egypt. For 400 years, they'd been building there, building all, all the great architecture for Egypt, for, for the Egyptian emperors and, and pharaohs and that. And after 400 years, God releases them. So here we have Joseph and Mary taking Jesus, Jesus' brothers and sisters as well, the family, to Jerusalem for God's party. Now church, before we get into this, let's remember that this Jesus, this babe, this child that we're speaking about here, he's 12 in this story, this was no average, ordinary 12-year-old. This was not an average, ordinary 12-year-old. Now I know that every parent thinks their child is the best in the world. And if you've got two, you've got two of the best in the world. But this one was no ordinary child. We're reading about Jesus. Now, the Bible's clear. The Bible speaks to us and says that God is a trinity. God is three in one. There's not three gods. There's one God. And God presents himself in the three persons of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One God presented in three ways. If we could create an analogy just for a moment, if we were to take H2O, H2O has three states. It it has the solid, which is ice. It has the liquid, which is water. It has the steam, which is gas, but it's all H2O. Similarly, God presents himself to humankind in three ways, as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So here, we are reading about not an ordinary 12-year-old child. We're reading about the God-man, the God-child. God, who in heaven, loving you so much that he wanted to be able to take you by the hand and walk you into eternal life with his Father so that we could spend eternity in heaven. An amazing, amazing thing. So no ordinary baby. So here it goes again. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem, his earthly guardians, took him to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover, celebration of God. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. Some scholars, some theologians suggest that this may have also been Jesus' bar mitzvah, which is where a young boy, in a sense, becomes a man in Jewish culture. The Bible doesn't say that, but they they speak about this because it's interesting that Jesus was 12 going to Jerusalem. Anyway, I digress. After the festival, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began to look to him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days... They found him sitting in the temple courts. Come on, parents. Are you feeling a little bit better about your parenting skills now? Mary and Joseph lose this 12-year-old son of theirs. Not an ordinary son. Remember the archangel Gabriel? Remember the heavenly host, the shepherds, the wise men, this virgin birth? Uh, uh, Mary Mary had never slept with a man. The Holy Spirit overshadowed her. The miraculous virgin birth of God's only son, and they lost God for three days. Okay, I'm going to go this side. They lost God for three days. I lost my daughter in a mall once for three minutes. It freaked me out. I got them to close the shop doors in the mall so that my daughter couldn't, be, couldn't escape. I didn't know where she was. Three minutes. They lost him for three days. Could you remember, Matt? Come on, come on. Imagine the conversation. Mary saying to Joseph, I thought you had him. She's like, he's like, no, I thought you had him. And she's saying, I'm going to kill you. And he's like, I think we're already dead. We've lost God. I like to imagine that may, maybe Joseph had a little bell. And, and whenever he had issue with Jesus, he would ring the bell. And Gabriel would go, yes, how can I help you? But here we have this crazy moment where they lose him for three for Three, 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 they lost their son for three days. Now, in the last 10 years of church, on two or three occasions, both my wife and I, who came in separate cars, have gone home to realize we've left our kids at church. It's happened three times. 
okay? They'll be all right, fend for themselves. They're older. They lost him for three days. Uh, am I making myself clear here? They lost God for three whole days, and after three days, they find him sitting in the temple courts. Uh, there he was, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mom said, son, why have you treated us this way? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Read between the lines. Jesus, when you get home, we are going to smack your backside. Am I right? I know we're living in 2017. You know, they smack people these days. But in these days, they did. I can imagine Mary and Joseph walking back to Nazareth. Uh, Mary going, I'm going to smack his backside. Jayon, I'm going to smack his backside. Uh, three days, three days. And Joseph going, Mary, I don't know if we can smack God. Mary's like, I don't care. I'm so mad. Come on, we all know what crazy mum is like. Crazy mum. She, she's crazy mum. I'm going to smack him. I don't think we should. He's gone. I don't care. Uh, she's, she, she's amazed. We're anxiously searching for you. And Jesus just gently replies, why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be in, in my father's house? Which I imagine maybe made Mary even angrier. He didn't say, Mom, I'm so sorry for your concern, for your anxiety. He's like, what are you talking about, Willis? I was here the whole time. It's crazy. But here's, here's the amazing thing. They lost God. And you know something, church? I think that we too... We all, at times, as followers of Jesus, this was Mary, this was Jesus' mother and, 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 and earthly father, but, but, but I think they lost him. If they lost him, how much more guilty are we at times? Don't like the word guilty, but you know what I mean, of losing Jesus also. That, that every one of us, actually, if we're not careful, we run the risk of losing the point of this Christmas season, especially if you've been to 45 church services at Christmas, like I have over the last 45 years of my life, 45 years of going to carol services, 45 years about hearing from the baby. It's easy to come and sit and just be here out of the sense of just due diligence and actually lose Jesus. Can I suggest a few ways how they lost Jesus this morning? I think that the first way they actually lose Jesus here in this text is they lose him through presumption. Because the Bible says here, thinking he was in their company. Thinking he was there. They lost him through, they lost him through presumption. To presume means, it means to take for granted that something exists or is in place. They lost him through presumption. Uh, do you know this week when Sophie and I went away for two days to York to celebrate 22 years of marriage, you know what I did? I, I created my mental checklist. I know what I need to take. Whenever I travel to different parts of the world, depending on where I'm going, I know I have a mental checklist. Uh, I used to have a written one, but I don't bother with that anymore. It's now, it's, it's more dangerous to play the mental one because hopefully you forget something. It's much more exciting that way. And so you create this, this mental checklist. Uh, international travel adapter, check. Passport, Check. Depending on which country I'm going to, Imodium. Check. Check, 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 check. Um, uh, malaria tablets. Check. And I go through, through this checklist of, of, of everything, of everything. Now, a few years ago, we went on a summer vacation. And both of our children, because they're both of our children, were both born. They were both born on the 22nd of August, three years apart. Because we're disciplined in our house. That's just the way it is. And so usually, when we're on a summer vacation, and our kids are there too, our kids have a birthday while we are there. It also means that when my daughter turns 21, my son will turn 18 the same day. Please pray for me, in Jesus' name. But you know, I've got to be honest, we went on this vacation, it was Mallorca or somewhere like that, and we did a checklist. We went passport, check, uh, uh, tablets, check, uh, international adapter that I'll leave in another hotel room, check. Uh, everything was done, but I remembered to take my son... And I remembered to take my daughter. I didn't just presume that they were going to get on the, flight, on the flight. I'm like, come on, kids. We're getting on the flight. We actually happened to forget the kids' presents that year, didn't we? I thought you packed them. You thought I packed them. I presumed that you did it, and you presumed that I did it. And so we woke up on the kid's birthday and said, surprise, you got nothing today. Here's a cake we bake you. Everything was on the list. Joseph and Mary returning home from God's party. Have you got the sticker rock for granny that we bought in Jerusalem? Check. 
Have we got the, the, uh, the eye wrinkle cream from the Dead Sea that we bought down at that market? Check. Have we got the passport for that border control crossing? I made that up. Check. Have we got all our plugs? Check, check, check. Let's go. But nobody actually checked to see if Jesus was there. Hey, let me just throw this out, church. When did you last check to see if Jesus was there? Hey, I'm not talking about his omnipresence. I'm talking about that manifest presence, that sense that, that God is, is with me. My friend, when, when, when did you last hear the whisper of God? Not on a Sunday, because that's too easy. I'm talking about Monday to Saturday. When did you last hear the whisper of God in the workplace? When did you last hear the whisper of God when you were walking through our city? When, when, when were you were last aware and say, God, I'm just checking to make sure you're here? One of my favorite preachers of all times, Jonathan Edwards, preached an amazing message in the 1700s called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. It's a, it's a, it's a staggering message. They said that while he preached on, on eternity in hell, that there was almost a sense the anointing was so strong in the room that people could literally smell the sulfur of hell. And even if you go to that church, I think in New England right now, there are bite marks on the back of the pews in front of people crying out to God for mercy. And the way he would preach is this, is that at every step on the way up to the podium, by the way, he was half blind, so he would read his notes like this. See, he didn't have a catwalk or anything. On every step, he would stop. He'd say, God... I'm not going any further until you're with me. And they just keep singing their songs. I'm not going any further until you're with me. And he wouldn't take a step until he had that conscious sense. You know, sometimes, church, I think we lose God because we presume too much. We presume on his omnipresence and so end up tolerating a life without his manifest presence. And in the midst of the busyness and the distraction of life, we lost Jesus. Because we presume. Let me say a few things about the 10 o'clock service. Not you guys, because you're perfect. But in the 10 o'clock service, you know those 10 o'clock Christians who come to Audacious or the 5.30 crowd on a Saturday night? You know, if any of them are habitually, regularly late every 10 o'clock service, you know something? They're presuming too much. They're presuming that the church family doesn't need them. They're presuming that God will wait to do something. And what happens is, is through presumption, we've lost God. Church, I want to say this about our tithes and offerings. Uh, if, if we're not a part of honoring God first in our finances, then we presume that God will bless our finances. We presume that God will bless the workplace. We'll presume that we'll have favor, but we're not honoring God with the very thing he asks us to do. We're losing Jesus because our Christian faith is becoming one based on presumption and not on the reality. Just checking. Lord, you're in my workplace. Lord, I'm just checking that you're in my sleeping hours. He neither sleeps nor slumbers. He neither sleeps nor slumber, so you can sleep nor slumber. When did you last check going to bed? Lord, I'm just checking you're with me tonight. I'm not talking about a living a life of anxiety and stressing out, but that conscious sense, my friend. I want you to know that you can live a life with the manifest presence of God in your life. Presuming. And so many Christian people, not this service because you're perfect, but in other services, other churches, presuming of God. And we lost him. We presume so much. We forgot what it was like to feel the embrace of the loving arms of Father. We forgot what it was to hear that still small whisper of the Spirit of God saying, I love you. I'm with you. I'll lead you. And I'll guide you. And it's oh so subtle, but it's only then when we end up walking through the valley of the shadow of death, of death, that's when we end up throwing the baby out with the bathwater. That's when we end up turning our back on our faith and turning our back on church. Because for years, we lived a life of presuming he was there, but didn't bother to stop and pray David's prayer. Search me, O Lord. Or test my heart. See, is there any wicked way in me? Ah, oh, church, I want to encourage you today. Let's not be a people who lose Jesus through presumption. Not only that, but secondly, I reckon they lost Jesus in the crowd. The Bible says here, thinking he was in their company. 
Think, no, think in, in the company. A better word for company is this word here, crowd. You see, here's, here's, here's the scenario. Joseph Mary Jesus lived in Nazareth. Nazareth was a 31-hour walk, 31-hour walking time to, to Nazareth to Jerusalem. And so whenever they went together, the way they would do it is this. They would not go just in family or extended family, but usually whole villages would travel together for safety purposes in case there were animals, um, robbers, bandits, or whatever. And so a whole crowd would go from Nazareth to Jerusalem, and the same crowd would walk together home. You can imagine with me the elders of the city who would sit at the city gates, the town gates. They would say, they would send out a memo, they would send out an email all across Nazareth and say, hey guys, just to let you know, we are leaving, leaving on such and such a day at such and such a time. We will meet you at this neighborhood and then we're going to walk. It's going to take about seven days camping. We're going to make our way there. And they would all travel in a crowd. There would be three groups of people who would travel. The first group that would travel would be the married women. The married women would walk together because how many of you know the married women love to talk? My wife often says to me, she goes, hey, Glenn, what are you thinking? And I'm saying, nothing. And it freaks her out. She's like, how can you be thinking nothing? And I'll say, simple, just done it. What's the connect with the inner emotions? Uh, what's going on in, inside my head? There's nothing going on. Just loving Jesus. It's called Sila, sister. It's called stay. So I'll let you know. It can happen any moment, any time. So the married women will walk together. Yeah, I know. Oh, I'm in trouble now. So the married women walk at the front of the column. In the middle were, were, were the singles, the, the older brothers and sisters, the singles who would look after the children. They would walk in the next group. And then at the guy at the back were, were all the married men who just kind of hang out. Well, the men didn't want to be at the front talking to the women. The men didn't want to ha be hassled by the kids in the middle, Jayon. None of that stuff. They just wanted to hang around at the back talking about the football scores, talking about Bethlehem FC versus Nazareth, Nazareth FC. Just see the game? Yeah, heck of a game, heck of a game. And so there would be the three groups of people in in a crowd, walking from uh, Nazareth to Jerusalem, Jerusalem to Nazareth, and they lost him in the crowd. Come on, not any ordinary 12-year-old. The Son of God, they lost him in the crowd. They lost him in the crowd of people uh, in Jerusalem. They lost him in the crowd that was walking home. And church, I want you to know that we too can lose Jesus in the crowd. I'm not talking about thousands of people who call Audacious Church home because a crowd can be two. I'm talking now about our personal responsibility with Jesus Christ. That, that sense that, that this is great to, to have the God of Audacious Church and, and, and the churches all around this area, but church, I want you to know that the best place to walk away from God is in a church just like ours where it's exciting and energetic and we're enthusiastic. And Sunday comes and Sunday goes and we come and our spirituality is sustained by the quality of the person that we sit next to on a Sunday and they encourage us in life groups, but all too often, not you because you're perfect, but in the 10 o'clock service, all too often we forgot. We forgot that this is about my relationship with him. Folks, today in this crowded room, it's about your relationship with Jesus. How you doing? How you doing? We, we all have times when we're closer to Jesus. We feel closer. He's close all the time. His omnipresence is close. But how you doing? They lost him in the crowd. And whether it's a crowded room like this, it's a bigger room with thousands or it's a small gathering of five, two, you can lose Jesus in the crowd. And that's what the Bible says 
that they did. They lost him in the crowd, thinking he was in their company. Third way that they lost him here is they lost him through preoccupation and distraction. They were so busy getting ready to travel home. They were so busy doing the right things that they forgot the most important thing. I'm speaking right now to every pastor in our church, every life group leader, every regional pastor, every sound lighting engineer, every person in the studio at the back, every person in the gallery. I want you to know that you can do the right thing but get distracted doing the right thing. You can be a preacher on the world's greatest stage and get distracted from what the whole point is. And the point is not the size of the gathering, the nature of the building, the whole point. Jesus. Gone quiet. You see, the devil doesn't want you to sin. That's not his focus. His focus is to get us distracted. If he can get you distracted, he's got you where he wants you. We're not going to go for a show of hands, but I wonder how many couples on the way to church this morning maybe had a major disagreement in the car. I wonder how many of us even right now are distracted on our phone by WhatsApp and text messages and looking at the news and different things like that. You see, when we're distracted, we're missing the point. That's why we encourage you, get into airplane mode on a Sunday. Focus on the moment. Because the enemy is not focused on getting you to sin, he's focused on getting you distracted. Because if you can be distracted long enough, then you can lose Jesus too. When we lived in Sheffield, we lived... Uh, I get really bad hay fever, especially where we used to live. Because out the, out the front and the back, there was these big fields of, what was it, yellow stuff? Yeah, what's it called here, though? Granola? No, canola. Canola. What's that yellow stuff? Is it called that? Okay, rapeseed. Okay, whatever. Rapeseed. Just growing out the back and the front. And my eyes were sneezing and, and bloodshot eyes. And, and, and my pastor, he'd said to me, he said, hey, Glenn, you're often late to the staff meeting. No more. The staff meeting used to be at 7.30. He said to me one day, if you're late for the staff meeting one more time, I'm going to fire you. So I knew I had to get to church on time for the staff meeting, 7.30 a.m. staff meeting on a Tuesday. Uh, I love our staff much more than that. Ours is at 1 p.m. in the afternoon on a Tuesday. And so I remember this one day, I woke up, I'm, I'm taking nasal spray and I'm taking tablets, I'm taking eye drops because my hay fever is so bad. And as I'm racing out the door, because I'm thinking, I I don't want to be late for the staff meeting, I remember to myself, man, I haven't taken my eye drops. I think, I've got time. I've got one minute. So I race upstairs to the bedside table. I get the dropper bottle, and I go to the full-length mirror in the hallway, and I'm trying to get the eye drops, the drops into my eye, and I'm shaking it. And while I'm shaking it, distracted because of time, I'm shaking it, I'm thinking to myself, "This this doesn't feel like my eye dropper bottle. This is going through my head. This doesn't look like my eyedropper bottle either. Have you ever put Olbus oil in your eye? At the top of my voice, I screamed, eucalyptus oil, hit my bloodshot eyes. I screamed at the top of my voice. I am laying like a paralyzed man on the floor, screaming at the top of my voice. It happened because I was distracted. Folks, think about this. Think about some of the conversations, the hurts, the things you've been involved in as a Christian, which had you have not been distracted, you never would have got into that conversation. You never would have allowed that, that, that offense to take root in your heart. Because here's the point. They lost Jesus through distraction. And I think fourthly, the way they lost Jesus was through, they lost him through ownership, a, a lack of ownership. Mary assumed Joseph would look after Jesus. Jesus, uh, Joseph assumed Mary would. Uh, nobody took ownership of the issue. Nobody actually thought, you know what? It's my job. parable of the good Samaritan teaches anything, Chip. It teaches us this. If you think it's not your job, it probably is your job. Because in the parable of the good Samaritan, they walk past. They said, not my job. 
But it took the lowest of the low, a Samaritan, despised, to be the hero of the day who took ownership. Folks, let me just say this. That church, this Christian life, you've got to take ownership. That it's not about how great the band play and, and, and they're great. It's not about how great our worship leaders lead us and, and they're great at that. And, and it's not about how great our preachers preach and hopefully they do great at that. It's about ownership. I've got to be honest, over the years of talking to thousands of Christians globally, one-on-one, -on -one, most conversations start off with how another person said something to them and made them feel a certain way which is really ultimately about deflection because they lost Jesus because of ownership. Pastor Holy Church, let me just say this to you. That though there may have been bad times in your life that you were not responsible for, maybe in family, maybe in relationships, maybe in business, crisis has come your way. Challenges have come. And you've thought, well, if God, you're good, where are you in this? About 18 months ago, I preached a message called Why Does Bad Stuff Happen to Good People? You can pick that up down the back. That it's easy for us to focus our attention and get distracted by what other people said or did rather than taking ownership and saying this, Lord, I didn't want this to happen. I don't like that this happened. It didn't make me feel good and it doesn't make me feel good. But I take ownership. What is it, God, that you want to achieve in my head, in my head, in my heart? What do you want me to learn? Because ultimately, God's more interested in the person you're becoming than the destination you're trying to get to. Take ownership. Take ownership. We take ownership with a big give, don't we, Stu? We take ownership. We're going to bless 200 families who live within a mile or so of this place. Families who, who, who are, are, are this, this Christmas are looking, looking down the barrel of poverty and, and tragedy. We're, we're taking ownership. Folks, we put on the pantomimes and the carol services so that together we can take ownership. I want to bring a friend. I want to see a city one for God. We create these opportunities for people to come and hear, hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're, we're all involved. Why? Because we're taking ownership. And maybe if Mary or Joseph had taken ownership, they would not have lost Jesus. <laughs> Losing Jesus. So here's my question. What do you do if you've lost Jesus. You love him. You love the Christian faith. You love church, maybe, or maybe you don't. You've been walking with God for a long time. But honestly, if you were to say, Glenn, if you were to look into my heart, you'd see that I've lost Jesus. I've lost the art of hearing his voice. I've lost, lost the ability of knowing what it is to be led by him to feel the embrace of the Father's love. I've lost Jesus. What do you do if you've lost Jesus? Well, the answer is really simple. Number one, admit that you've lost him. Admit it. Maybe in a moment's time, you need to get on your knees before God and say, Lord, I, I've lost you. I got preoccupied. I got busy. I got distracted. I forgot that this life was not about how much I can get and keep and gain and attain. This life is about you. This life is about, is, is just a, uh, the, the shop window into eternity uh, for a man's life uh, short, four score years and some, and that's it. And then we step into eternity. Uh, I've lost you, Jesus. You may be a pastor. You may be a business person, a family, life group leader. It's not wrong to admit you've lost Jesus. It's a courageous thing to do. Admit that you've lost him. 
I love what the Bible says here in Luke chapter 15. It's one of my favorite verses because in Luke chapter 15, it's about the prodigal son. And it says this, when the prodigal son came to his senses. And maybe today this is really what this message is all about. Maybe it's a message for you just saying, you know what, Glenn, I'm coming to my senses. I've lost Jesus. We're going to pray in a moment's time. Number one, admit that you've lost him. The second thing is this, is look. I mean, really look. Look. Really look. My mum used to say, I'd say to my mum, Mum, where's such and such a thing? She'd say, oh, it's upstairs in your room. And I'd go upstairs and, and, and I'd come back and say, Mum, I can't see it. She'd no, I've seen it. Go up there. So I'd go up there and I'd come back. She goes, no. And I'd say, no, it's not there. So mum would come up and the first thing she would do, she'd walk into the room and goes, here it is, right in front of your eyes. You can't see for looking. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. I want you to know he's near always because of his omnipresence. But you can know the joy of living life with his manifest presence. Hearing his voice. Sensing his touch. God with you. Admit that you've lost him. Look. Really look. And the last thing is this. Return to where you left him. That infuriates me. If I would say to Arnold, Arnold, I've lost my phone. Where's my phone? And if Arnold said to me, where did you leave it? I'd say, if I knew where I left it, it wouldn't be lost. Let me ask this question. Where'd you lose him? Where'd you leave him? In what area of distraction and preoccupation and crowd? Uh, what, what was it that you were doing at that time where you look back and you go, you know what, Glenn, actually, it, 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 it's, it's not been until that moment in time when I sensed God. I actually sensed His touch. I was 12 when I first sensed the voice and the touch of God. And it changed my life. Where'd you leave him? Mary's flustered. Mary says, son, we've been looking for you for three days. And Jesus casually replies, in Luke chapter 2, didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? And here's the point. Jesus was never lost. He was always where he was meant to be. Jesus is not lost. We're lost without him. At the end of the first service this morning, our youth pastor, Josh, sent me a, a beautiful text, actually. And Josh said this, awesome preaching. Thumbs up, thumbs up. Thanks, man. Appreciate that. He said this, my thought in the worship at the start of the 10 o'clock service was this, you're never more found than when you're lost in his presence. I thought, oh, I wish I wrote that. Jesus is not lost. He's where he's meant to be. About his father's business. And he's still there. His father's business. The house of God. Acts chapter 20 says this, verse 20. It says, the church, the house of God. God, Jesus, bought this with his blood. I want you to know, God is passionate about his plans for your life. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a future and a hope. God is passionate about his word for your life. The Bible says in Isaiah 55, 11, is it that his word will not return void. God is passionate about your family. I know that because God put his son Jesus in a family. It's so important. I want you to know that God is, God is passionate about salvation. 1 Samuel 14, 14. God devises ways. He comes up with schemes and ideas and ways whereby when we were not connected with him, we could get connected with him. He's passionate about all those things. Jesus is not lost. 
He's simply where he's meant to be. And I want you to know, church, that he is here right now. And I want you to know that when you wake up tomorrow morning, he's next to your bed right there. And will you say, Lord, help me be aware of you today. Because a life lived with God is an outstanding life.